Perfect. So hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for this SEDS Online webinar. Um, first off, we want to always thank the IES for their financial sponsorship. And this really allows us to offer really great resources. Make sure and check out the website. There are virtual field trips. There's all of the scientific webinars up there, um, teaching resources. So um, it's a great tool. So as all of the teaching starts back up at universities, whether live or online, this might um, really be helpful for you. So make sure and check that out. All right, so today our lecture is from Dr. Michael Strasser, who's a professor at the University of Innsbruck. Um, Mickey got his bachelor's and his doctorate from ETH Europe, uh, Zurich, where he was also an assistant professor for four years. He did a postdoc stint at Marum, um, which you might have got a little, a little nugget of information if you've been with us for the last few minutes, but he'll be talking to us about some of that research that he's been doing in collaboration with them. So his research focuses on the quantitative characterization of sedimentary and tectonic processes. He looks at things such as sediment deformation and failure and mass transport mechanisms. So much of his work helps predict and understand various types of geohazards. And today he will be talking to us about extreme events in the geologic record. So Mickey, with that, I will give you the mic. Well, thank you very much, Chelsea, for this, for this introduction. And hello, everybody in the virtual um, webinar environment here. It, it's a real great pleasure and, and a great opportunity to, to present um, today some results from surveying, sampling, and studying a high-resolution stratigraphic succession of the sedimentary infill of a, of a deep sea trench. And, and uh, maybe one aspect that um, has not been highlighted now in, in this introduction is, is something which over the last maybe 10 years or so I really got fascinated about is to do research in the deep sea. And, and before I go into details and, and, and present you results, let, let's, let's talk um, a little bit about what, what do I mean by deep sea or actually ask the question of, um, of how deep is deep. Um, I hope this forwards now. Yes. So, so, so how deep is deep and, and what, what I'm referring to the deep sea if I talk to you today. And I'm basically referring to this map that shows the deepest area of our oceans, documenting that actually only about 2% of the total surface area of the seafloor is occupied by the so-called Haddle zone, which is the zone um, uh, uh, which is deeper than 6,000 6, meter and more water depth. So these are all the red um, areas. In, in this um, on this map, and you can see that most of these areas actually follow along these these trenches, and and there are actually only 16 trenches throughout our world's ocean that are deeper than 7,000 meters, and and obviously there are major technological efforts um, needed in order to survey, study, and sample these really remote environments. Yet for us sedimentologists. These are potentially very interesting places to be investigated, as they can be considered as the ultimate terminal sinks for sediment mass transfer by our surface and marine sediment mass transport processes. And as I will show you later, they're really related to subduction zones, um, where we may learn something about subduction zone dynamics and behaviors. Um, so most efforts so far um, have been invested um, to study the deepest known point in your seabed hydrosphere, which is the approximately 10,920 meter deep Challenger deep in the east pond of the Mariana Trench. So despite the general decrease in the abundance of biomass of organisms with increasing depths, which is generally no, these video surveying, surveying and also sampling campaigns in this Haddle Trench have revealed a diverse array of metazoan organisms consisting primar primarily of benthic fauna. As you can see on the lower left here, um, or the lower right. So docu and, but, but these studies also document microbial biomass and phytopigment concentration and other in fauna abundances, as well as benthic carbon mineralization rates that are much higher in the trench than in their adjacent abyssal plains. So yet um, process of, of how sediments and, and oceanic uh, carbon is supplied to these haddle zones where oceanic car organic carbon is considered to play an important role in the deep marine carbon cycle and its support haddle ecosystem remains largely unknown. 
Um, a peculiar physiographical characteristic of hadletrange is, is that they are typically long and narrow and run parallel to or near extensive island arc system or continental land masses. The trench are typically um, typified by nearly V-shaped cross-section with an average steepness of 5 to 15 degrees, or they may even reach up to 15, uh, up to 45 um, degrees. Um, so very, very steep environment, which potentially may have interesting sediment, uh, uh, sediment dynamic um, processes. So most trench floor have narrow, typically two to five kilometer wide flat sedimentary bodies, suggesting sedimentation processes filling in this ultra deep water depression. And as we just chatted before, before starting, like I'm, I'm now living in this, this mountain valley here, uh, carved by glacials. This is also about two to five kilometer wide and has a flat bottom and is obviously infilled by a lot of, uh, by a lot of sediment. So this, this is how I, how I connect like physiographies and processes um, into the deep sea. Coming, coming back from these small excursions of, um, of like where I live now and, and where I study the ultra deep environment on our planet. Um, and, and, and kind of thinking about how sediments and organic carbon might come in, into these environments there. Um, there, it has initially been speculated by physical oceanographers and marine biologists that because of this peculiar geometry, there might be propagating internal tides or, or, or bottom currents that would funnel oceanic carbon uh, towards the trench bottom by such uh, and, and sustain these haddle ecosystems. Yet for us geologists, obviously plate tectonic must be the driver that uh, of the formation of these haddle trenches as shown by this cartoon cross section of the Mariana Arc trench. The trench forms due to the bending of the old and cold oceanic crust um, in, in such subduction zones. Thus, Deep water trench exclusively occur in highly active tectonic environment with frequent occurrence of subduction zone earthquakes. Therefore, and coming back to this question, how, how is sediment and, and, and organic carbon sustained and transported into this uh, deep water environment? There is, we can formulate alternative hypothesis that actually event related sediment gravity flows triggered by earthquakes uh, may also have the potential to transfer, deposit, and eventually bury waste amount of sediment and uh, organic carbon in oceanic trenches. If we look a little bit on, on, on earthquakes, as I introduced here in terms of subduction zone dynamics, uh, on a global average, there is about one magnitude eight class earthquake that occurs per year. And on, on a global average. And, and most subduction boundaries have produced such great earthquakes. In contrast, we are only aware of four giant magnitude nine class earthquakes from our instrumental record that are well documented. There are some historic ones, um, and there is the, the emerging research of paleoseismology that is trying to reconstruct um, these giant earthquakes. But obviously, as of now, short historical and even shorter instrumental records limit our perspective of earthquake magnitude and recurrence. This is why examining prehistoric events um, preserved in the geological record is really essential for long-term history of giant earthquakes. And the sedimentary archive of deep sea trenches might be might be the clues for such needed paleoseismology research. As I mentioned before, yet the deep sea research relies really on technological advances. And, and these technologies were long unable to sample the sedimentary archive and documenting sedimentological processes in the deep sea. So Hadle Trench sedimentology and paleoseismology research only now starts to emerge with increased technological capacities of modern research vessel. So this is actually kind of as an introduction and the motivation with like coming from the paleoseismology side and having access through collaboration in, in, in the German um, marine uh, research community to such modern research vessel. That's when, when I got involved um, some, some nine years from now, 
um, after the 2011 earthquake um, that had a magnitude nine here highlighted in red, um, hit the east coast of north northwest um, of, of northern Japan. So, so basically, in terms of research, um, I, I should actually have the title of my presentation, which where where I will introduce now a summary of like nine nine years or, or maybe six six or seven years because the first years were just basically data acquisition of, of research in the Japan branch and how it relates to the Tohoku earthquake. So I, I rather should have the title of this presentation that extreme, extreme events archived in the geological record of the Japan branch. And such a such research obviously never is a one man show. So so to start with I would like to acknowledge um, in, in representation of these two fantastic um, research or, or science parties on these two cruises of which I'm going to present data now. And these are my, my German um, colleagues and mentors, Akim Kopf and, and Gerald Weber, who were together with me uh, co-chiefs on, on, these, on these cruises on board the research vessel zone. And then most of the data I'm going to present today actually has been elaborated in a, in a project that was funded by the Austrian Science Foundation, FWF, that is just about being finishing right now. So we worked over the last four years in this fantastic teams with, with, with young and brilliant researchers um, here, here at the University of Innsbruck, but also in collaboration with, with Japanese colleagues and, uh, and Tim Eglinton from the ETH theory. And last but not least, um, that I will, towards the end of the, um, of the talk, I will introduce you to an IODP initiative, which based on this research emerged and, and which um, myself together with a huge group of, of interested submarine um, paleoseismology people have proposed to the IODP system and eventually kind of made our way through the system and are now scheduled for implementing an IODP expedition in the Japan trench, which hopefully will provide ample and great opportunities for doing some advanced research of what, of, of what I'm going to introduce now. So I acknowledge also all these people that contributed to this presentation. What I'm going to do now in like the next, whatever, 30 minutes or so, is, is trying to summarize the key results of, of some of the, the most relevant scientific outputs of, of this project, of these projects, I have to say. Um, so um, I guess I guess you will see the the DOI numbers printed uh, in the chat. So you may also just like, skim through these pre these papers while while I try to lead you through um, these these results. So let's go to the to the subduction margin of um, of Japan and and the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, which was like the initiation of this entire research program. Um, as you all know, I guess, or may remember, uh, it was a devastating tsunami that also hit the Fukushima nuclear power plant and got wide attention. Scientifically, there has been a huge effort in on seismology and also ocean research drilling to understand the tectonic and the co-seismic slip and the seismology aspect or tectonoseismic aspect of this earthquake. And by now we have a quite good understanding as you can see here, like the rupture, and actually there is a something like 40 to 50 meter co-seismic slip towards the trench, really close to the trench. So that was really a devastating environment uh, event that also must have had huge effects on on the sedimentary environment in this in this Haddle deep sea trench. Um, so what 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 we did, and just like as a short summary on the data that we contributed by this. Um, uh, these two research cruises, and I should say, actually, it's it's just the data on the left-hand side here, which is a, a, a very very high resolution um, uh, bathymetry map that only was capable of using the latest um, multi-beam sonar system on the new research vessel. That for such a huge water depth, where obviously the footprint and the uncertainties on exact uh, positions just is fantastic. So, and I will show you some zoom-ins 
onto this onto this bathymetric map, um, where everything sh uh, deeper than six thousand here is, is is plotted. So we have some eight kilometer deep space in the source and some other um, other trench basins here that that reach seven kilometers in deep. Um, the reflection seismic data here is contributed or has, has been acquired with huge efforts by Jamstack and Japanese research vessel. But part of that FWF project that I mentioned in the beginning where we were, where we were working was actually aiming at, at bringing these data sets together in, and, and so for a, for a coherent interpretation. So actually I'm showing here also the Japanese data um, just to illustrate that the physiography or the geological setting is, is this small isolated um, base instead of formed by the subduction horse and gravel topography while it bends into the subduction zone. Um, we, we also did some, some uh, flow analysis to kind of understand sediment routing patterns. And one specific feature of this particular Hubble trench um, is that it actually most it's just fed by local sources. So you kind of see this, this flow path. So we're still kind of a few 50 kilometers or so away from shore. So the source of, of, of sediment gravity flows actually is, is, not, is not the land, but must be here, the upper slope. Only in the very south and in the very north, there may, might be some canyons that, that incise um, more shallow. And I will present a little bit discussion about how we know um, what are the sediment distribution pattern that shed sediments into, into the trench. But most of the trench actually is, is really only local submarine sources. Then we also spent enormous amount of time just mapping the deep sea trench by using high resolution parasound. Um, this is a, just a high frequency um, uh, hydroacoustic surveying tool, also at the latest technology on, on board the, the new research vessel SOMNE, which allowed us to create this, 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 um, these images. And, and just like as a comparison in terms of investment, when I was chief scientist on that cruise, I just left the ship, which is quite an expensive ship on a daily rate, um, just survey at four knots in order to really have slow condition, but that's what is needed to map the deeps, these deep waters where the footprint of the geoacoustic survey is actually so large. But nevertheless, this presents like kind of unique images of this ultra deep water environment. And I will come back later what, what, what Pioca here has, has actually mapped with these different colors. In particular, also using uh, the very long wire um, of, of the research vessel, um, you, need, you need quite some wire and quite some winch power to lower a gravity core or a piston core down to seven kilometer water depth. It takes about half a day to just take a core, so enormous investments, but I hope I will convince you that it was worth investing this ship time in order to sample. And, Probably, and we, we did quite some research, it's actually the first long course or, um, on, on in this deep water environment. So there have been a lot of short course and, and, um, and kind of um, samples of, of the surface course, but actually really accessing the sedimentary archive of such Hubble trenches was probably the first by, by these cruises and also by some of the Japanese cruises, which we, we merged and going to present. So, so far about the methods and um, coming back to, um, to the, to the Tohoku Oki earthquake um, and its fingerprint in the deep sea. So this, this earthquake is, is really the first kind, um, this, the first event of its kind worldwide where the entire activity was recorded by offshore geophysical, seismological, and geodetic instrument. I'm not, not even going to, to present you this data because it would be a, yet another, another talk by itself. Um, but, but you can see all these, all these uh, dots here that, that actually are, are, are represent cores and instruments that, that have acquired data before, during, and after the Earth. And, and also there are there, there were several fast response research cruises, one of which was, was our Sony cruises, but many Japanese cruises um, that actually caught earthquake triggered sediment remobilization. It's quite fantastic what we learned. And, and one, one um, observation was um, by a very early cruise 
um, that actually like four four months after the earthquake, they surveyed, they video surveyed um, the trench all the way down to seven kilometer depth. And what they found is that even four months after the earthquake, there still was um, obscuration on this video survey, still turbulent clouds, um, that is up to 40 meters thick. So, so it's still four months after the earthquake, there was a 40 meter thick suspension cloud kind of hanging around in the trench and kind of slowly, slowly sedimenting. The resulting deposits here shown by a short core, so these are only 50 centimeters, and, and the X-ray CT image of it showing nicely homogeneous sediment on the top all the way up to the water sediment interface. And here are radionuclide data um, with uh, excess latitude 10 and, and cesium 137, which are very short-lived um, isotopes that, uh, that, that indicate this, this very high activity rate and kind of homogeneous. So the entire sediment of this suspension cloud must be very young. So this, because it contains radionuclides that can't be older than a few tens of years. So that's, um, that, that's a key observation that was done already kind of by, by monitoring aspects here. I just highlight this latitude 10 axis. And then we added um, along the entire trench from the very south to the very north, um, a series of, of cores um, and could actually map and identify this event deposit, which is composed of very homogeneous um, Item bearing mud um, um, and, and contains this, um, this excess latitude, and suggesting that it's very, very young, remobilized setting. Um, strikingly, also, if we look at the total organic carbon in these event deposits, we see that they are heavily enriched. So these very young sediments that are somehow remobilized, they also bring a lot of fresh total organic, uh, fresh um, organic carbon into the trend. So Arata Kyoka in his, in, his, um, in his postdoc project here in Innsbruck um, then kind of used the, this, this um, um, parasound data to map the, the homogeneous layer, which is nicely visible in, the, in this high resolution subsurface imaging data. And here you can see the beautiful high resolution symmetry maps of this small basins. There are many, many of these small basins, and then we can have a, a kind of a, a, another horse and graben structure that is obliquely subducting and go into next one. So when Jasper Mornot, who is also here with me in, in, uh, in, at the University of Innsbruck, with whom with him I do a lot of, of, of lake research looking at, at earthquake uh, triggered remobilization in lakes, he was on that cruise as well, and he was acquiring the, the um, the, the, the parasound data. And he just told me, oh, these are just tiny little small lakes that happen to be in seven kilometer water depths. But we can apply a lot of the concept that we have learned in the lakes. Anyway, I'm kind of distort distorting here. What I wanted to say is that Arata Kyoka uh, mapped all, this, all these deposits and actually could quantify using density data that we acquired on the core, could quantify the volume that was remobilized by, by this event. And, and we see here that these are, these are in 10 to the six cubic meters of tremendous volumes here in the south, but also slow, uh, still, still significant volumes of remobilization. And, and maybe even more interestingly, he, he used the total organic carbon um, measured on these cores um, to basically um, calculate or quantify not just the sediment volume, but actually the mass carbon. Um, that, that, trans, that was transported to the Hadel Trench by only this one single tectonic event. And it turns out that we're talking of something like 10 to the 12 gram carbons, just, just basically by one tectonic event. And, and even if we compare this um, on, on like a, a global organic carbon preserved in marine sediments, this actually is a significant contribution. And we can compare it a bit to other Hadel Trenches. I'm, I'm not going into the details here of this table, um, and I'm you're happy to read the details in, in this paper. Um, but we compare it to other, to other trenches and actually see that the surface sediment are, of the Japan Trench really have high organic carbon. And maybe this is just because we happen to have right now um, uh, 
earthquake remobilized sediment and, and fresh carbon, organic carbon at the surface um, today in the Japan Trench because there was this recent giant earthquake. Whereas in other in other hotel trenches, maybe maybe that that there was no large earthquake in the in the last couple of or tens of years, so there is there is less organic carbon. This is just a hypothesis which which needs to be tested in in in, in similar studies also in other trenches. Um, one key thing here, um, and I, I only have shortly time to develop this, but but if if we if we summarize now the fingerprints um, of this Tohoku Oki earthquake in the deep sea, then we learn that it's widespread, acoustically homogeneous, as you can see here, fine-grained, thick mud turbidites that are composed of very young organic carbon-rich sediments um, that are deposited in thermal um, basin. And we, I here kind of Make, make an interpretation and say that these must be remobilized marine surficial sediments. And this, how, how we, how we ima imagine this, and, and also Jasper was a kind of instrumental in developing these ideas in, um, in lakes, and, and, and uh, Cecilia McHugh has contributed some information, Ashi, um, on, on, on other settings. But, but there is like an emerging new paradigm um, that actually earthquake are not just triggering landslides that then evolve into turbidity currents um, as, as we kind of have this cartoon here kind of crossing out. Um, but what we think is, is an emerging concept is actually that earthquake shaking just peels off the very superficial sediment that is very young and organic rich because it may not be completely decomposed in the stratigraphic record. And, and, but if you do this over huge areas, you can actually accumulate enough volume to explain these deposits. Um, we, did, we did test this hypothesis um, on a slope core um, here in the northern part um, um, where, where we have actually three historically reported earthquake. And we wanted to, and this is just a 15 centimeter surface core of the uppermost, um, of the uppermost sediment column on, on, on this slope here. And we test, we, we basically did age, um, age determination uh, using radionuclides. Um, and and, we, and we, we were basically trying to identify if these are smooth, um, continuous column, um, but what we think um, this data, um, or how we interpret this data, is actually that we have gaps here. And if we date these gaps, these small gaps worth four centimeter, twelve centimeter, two centimeters or so, actually within our age uncertainties, nicely relate to this historic earthquake. And we also think that the physical properties here in a in a, in a CT images actually show that these are small events that just peel off this. Um, so this is, this is the, the, the concept of earthquake triggered surficial sediment remobilization that is likely the source. And I'm going to show you some more data uh, in support of this, um, of this important process. Okay, so far about what we learned about the, 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 the 2011 um, earthquake. Um, but, but having, having now access and, and course effect, um, sample the deeper stratigraphy and, and having the parasound data where we actually can, can do seismic stratigraphy on the deeper sedimentary infill, we can also look on, on, on the geolo in, into the geological record. And, and we, we have the Japan Trench as a fantastic kind of study area um, because the historic history of, of earthquake is, is quite quite fantastic, and there are reconstruction of, of rupture areas for historic earthquakes some 1,400 years back in time. So this is just shown here, and here again for physiography, you see these two canyons coming into the very southern trench and into the very northern trench. Um, and of course, we have to consider other processes that may trigger sediment remobilization, such as typhoons. And we just had last year two um, class five typhoons kind of coming over um, into the head areas here of the Nakamina To Canyon. So we can not yet con uh, entirely exclude that maybe also super typhoons may, may trigger here land derived 
um, sediments. But I will show you later, we may be able to test this by organic carbon geochemistry. I'll show you some data in a minute. Okay, let's, let's, let's go chronologically what we did. So the first cruise in uh, 2012, um, and also the Japanese effort at the beginning was only in this in this central area. This is where we had a major 50 meter trench, a slip to the toe, um, tectonic motion or, or co-seismic slip. So, so most of efforts were spent in the first few years there. And we were successful to, to gather many cores. And actually this is a compilation now published by, by Kenny Gehara in EPSL uh, some four years ago. Um, integrating cores from our from our Solne cruise, but also from Japanese cruise. So that was a true international collaboration to actually show the event stratigraphy in the central part. And and strikingly, in this in this up to 10 meter thick sediment cores, um, we recover basically the three major earthquakes. Um, that are reported in history. And we have a nice tephra layer in the middle of the stratigraphy, which is which we geochemically fingerprinted to be the, the, the fallout deposit of the Toa tephra that occurred in 950 um, common area. So this was a nice marker horizon. And we basically could, could, could correlate this the three um, thick turbidite sequence that have similar characteristics, some of which actually even thicker um, and, and, and within the sedimentary record, uh, apparently higher sediment removalization than the 2011 authors. So this kind of shows that there, there is promising, it's a promising setting to do paleoseismology um, since we can reconstruct the historical earthquake history. And then we also kind of went into this carbon geochemistry um, um, research topic together with, with the group of, of um, Tim Eglinton at ETH Zurich and, and people from Woods Hall. Um, and we, 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 we studied in, in kind of ultra high resolution radiocarbon geochemistry. And, and this is a seven meter core. And these are radiocarbon ages on bulk organic, on bulk sediment, bulk organic carbon. Um, every seven centimeters. So this is a huge high resolution profile. And interestingly, we see kind of linear trends in, in the background sediments. And we see increased radiocarbon ages by, by maybe two, two to 3,000 years older sediment than the background sediment. And we can also calculate the organic carbon fluxes in these events, and we learn that also here, not just as 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 we've learned for the for the for the Toku earthquake, um, but also for this prehistoric earthquake, that actually there is an increased organic flux. So we have we have basically um, in, so the hemipelagic sedimentation is interrupted by episodic deposition of pre-aged organic carbon. Um, so the, the core currents and pre aged um, with, with intervals corresponding to this known um, historic earthquake implies that episodic earthquake triggered gravity flows driven to, um, are, are driving supply um, of, of carbon to the trip. Um, Tobias Schwesterman in his PhD thesis, which, which he just a month ago um, completed, successfully completed here at the University of Innsbruck, worked on the same course with some innovative technologies, um, high resolution XRF core scanning and some advanced uh, multivariant statistical approaches to actually try to geochemically fingerprint these different event deposits and then correlate them. And, in, and I don't have time to, to go into detail here, but basically the, the, the colors you see here are, are um, multivariant cluster analysis based on this geochemical and physical property data. And already by this cluster analysis, we kind of learn that we can distinguish different, different um, deposits and, and, and so can infer for, for sediment source. And in his paper, he actually also discusses the role of tephra layers to be important for this process of, of, of surficial slope remobilization. But an interesting conclusion he made or in, in this paper is actually to consider again the age offset um, of the radiocarbon energy that you can see here. So this is the same data I showed you before 
um, um, with this with this age offset worth a few thousand years, and by by basically modeling the two end member scenario. You know, this is kind of the classical model. You have an earthquake that triggers a landslide, and the landslide somehow gets remolded or goes into into a debris flow or a turbidite. So you would expect actually a, a mixed integrated age of the entire stratigraphic column, and knowing the sedimentation rate on the slope. We kind of can see what we would expect, um, but these these age offsets here they actually suggest very very thin um, in in his in his calculations in the order of maximum a few decimeter worth of remobilization. So that was another independent um, kind of here from radiocarbon ages an independent test of the surficial sediment remobilization hypothesis. Um, Again, data from, from organic carbon and, and sediment provenance data um, um, by Schwesterman. And here I'm showing some, some, some results that are not published yet, um, but, but I think they are exciting. And, and we are just about resubmitting um, the, this, this manuscript after some moderate minor revisions. So we are positive that hopefully it will be published soon in EPSL. And again, very busy, many, many data. But basically what we are doing here is now, after all this organic geochemistry data um, or, or in the previous kind of phase of this research program, we now add the very south and the very north and kind of see the same pattern of, and, and this is a bit busy here. So we look at the C14Hs, we see everywhere where we have an event deposit color, we have a little bit older ages. Um, same here, this is a huge event deposit that is very homogeneous, very homogeneous ages, just some, some, some two or three are actually 4,000 years older than what the trend here is. Um, and maybe this is the moment for, for those that, that are familiar with, with radiocarbon dating and, and are closely looking at my small figures here. Um, obviously, um, the, the actual background sedimentation rate here is not the real age. So these are bulk organic carbon ages, and we see we have an offset of something like 1,600-ish. Actually, in, the, in this paper, we even kind of constraining and kind of having surface, uh, surface sediment to constrain it to, to quite narrow um, age ranges. And what fantastically, it just seems that the age offset of the bulk organic carbon is somewhat constant, at least for the northern area and, and slightly um, older than, than for, the, for, the, for the thousand area. But at least due to this constant shift, um, we can at least kind of have a floating stratigraphy um, and, and kind of linear increase in the background setting. So we are not actually dating to the point, um, absolute dating, but with this technique, we can, uh, we can do a, we can do a relative dating, so we still, but we still need to be tied to known tephra layers or other stratigraphic marker horizons. And obviously, and I haven't talked about this, but obviously this is all one of the, large, the, the, the major challenges if you work in deep water environments, because classical radiocarbon age dating or, or isotope stratigraphy or, or you know, whatever, whatever we would do, on mineralized um, calcites from 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 uh, pelagic uh, micro um, microfossils doesn't work because we are far below the carbonate compensation depth. So this is also an interesting environment where we have to come up with new innovative dating techniques, um, and and this is just kind of a, a way. And in this paper, we also do a lot of other organic uh, radiocarbon like ramp pyrolysis and dating different fractions of the organic compounds. Um, but I'm not going into the detail here. Um, one thing I would like to highlight on this plot though is that we also can constrain um, organic carbon provenance um, by looking at the TOCTN ratio or the delta C13 ratio and kind of plot all the data on like known delta C13 or TOCTN ratio plots and learn that actually all sediments, be it, be it the background sediments or be it the, um, the, the, the event deposits are all uh, marine or organic matter. If we would have terrestrial inputs from either C4 plants or even soils 
um, um, or our C3 plans, we would expect much higher TN, um, TOC to TN ratio. So this is another, um, another um, kind of hint that actually all the, the sediment um, that is deposited in, in the Japan Trench is of organic matter and also the events itself are not funneled through the canyons by, by terrestrial or, 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 um, or terrestrially, um, um, at least the carbon is not from terrestrial sources, but is marine um, in origin. So that's what I just said here. The canyons do not efficiently funnel terrestrial carbon into the trench and the bulk organic carbon signature corroborates this organic triggered event deposits and again supports the, 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 the superficial sediment remobilization hypothesis. Okay, getting more and more and more and more data adding up here. Um, this is actually a fantastic compilation. Um, that again, Arata Kyoka did in yet another paper contributed to Frontiers in Earth Sciences, where he actually now takes all the data available from cores, and I show you in a minute also from Parasound, um, basically going from south to the north, all the cores that we have. So these are, that's a, like a, a 10 meter depth scale here, and, and in, identify the different event deposits, and in color are the different correlations. Um, and also adding some age constraints um, here by bulk organic carbon. Um, so, so that's just core to core correlation. And uh, we can do core to seismic correlation. As I said, this is fantastic high resolution data in these ultra deep waters where we actually nicely can see actually each event that is worth a couple of decimeter thickness and, and forms these transparent seismic faces um, and ponding geometries we can, we can track and we can do core to core correlation. So we can map throughout the entire data set um, along the entire trench. And what results here is this very busy, but fantastic figure, um, basically showing each individual basin. You know, I, I mentioned before, we have this, this small, tiny little lake basins in the ultra deep water. These are the horse and graben. Um, basin or the, the graben basins, and since the Horst and Graben uh, strike is slightly ob obliquely subducting, we get a lot of small basins, and and all these are all these these basins here, and for each the basin we can map the the event deposits, and in in green are our colored um, event deposits that based on cores we had and, and, and knowing that the age dating we could actually assign to historic earthquakes. So that's like the last 1,500 years. We still miss uh, ground truthing here in the thousand part, but here in the center part, we have a very nice, you see a lot of greens here. And then below, obviously, and this is shown in the next figure, um, here is the core to seismic correlation, but we, we know from the Parasound data that actually that this, this record of, of, um, of uh, uh, basin field succession interbedded by episodic deposition of fine grained turbidites um, define clear targets for deep recording um, to sample older events that are not yet reached by conventional recording. Um, so, so obviously, there, there is the hypothesis there. That if we if we reach this these lower deposits and if we are able to constrain um, um, the, the depositional um, processes and, and and kind of um, test for earthquake trigger versus versus other um, trigger mechanisms, we might have a beautiful um, um, paleo earthquake record in that range. And this is and this is now coming to the end of my of my presentation, looking into the future. Um, this is what, what, what we have proposed starting some four or five years ago um, to, to IODP that it would be a, a great um, experiment or, or a great exercise to do to collect a lot of cores. And um, so this is what, have, what, what was scheduled initially for this springer spring. And actually I was supposed to be um, on, the, on the ship. So the idea is actually to use the research Vessel Kaime and its new giant piston coring facility that can core uh, 40 meter long um, giant piston core. Um, and we would use the, the Chikyu 
as as a laboratory where on a, in an onshore science park is so that GPU would be alongside in a harbor, but we would use the laboratories and to to basically process all these cores. Um, so it was postponed due to the pandemic, um, but it is rescheduled now for next year. And we, we we cross our fingers that the pandemic ends soon, and we bring all our 31 scientists from all over the world to Japan that we can conduct this um, this project. So what is it about? Um, we are we are basically um, want to track past earthquakes in the sedimentary record along the Japan Trench, and, and we want to test and develop submarine paleoseismology um, beyond what we did so far by calibrating the records to the historical um, record. So we want to identify and sedimentologically, physically, chemically, biogeochemically, um, develop proxy of event deposits in the sedimentary archive that allow recognition and dating of past giant magnitude nine class earthquakes versus smaller earthquakes versus other driving mechanisms. Uh, we want to explore the spatial and temporal distribution of such event deposits to investigate a long strike and time dependent variability of sediment source, transfer, deposition process, and stratigraphy. And we want to develop a long-term earthquake record for giant earthquake. But by doing so, actually, we are also just setting up a, a tremendous effort in, in sampling and the, this, this, uh, this, this sedimentary environment. So there will be a lot of focus on, on earthquake history research, but we will have a lot of scientists that actually will investigate that huddles, huddle zone sedimentology and microbiology and then geochemistry. So quite exciting. So what do we do? Uh, we want to do a multi-coring approach by mission specific platform. Um, for, for sampling um, that the shallow subsurface to, to recover the continuous upper Pleistocene to Holocene stratigraphic succession of trench field basins. And, and here, just like the, the sites that we have identified, there are actually 18 primary sites. So if, if we succeed, um, we will get a very, very dense sampling of, of, of something like 50 to 100,000 years record of this, this very high resolution um, deep sea trench record where we will apply multi-method applications to characterize these event deposits um, for which we have evidence um, in the, in the, in the um, geophysical data that they actually are there and there that, that we are able to sample them. Um, as I mentioned before a bit, the, the, probably the, the biggest challenge in, in this scientific endeavor um, is to, to develop high resolution stratigraphy and age control. Um, so one great thing of, of this area is there is quite a good um, radiolarian bio-event stratigraphy in the Northwestern Pacific. So we hope we will be able to use such bio-events. Um, there is fantastic tephra chronology record, even with different tephras from north to south. So these will be our, 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 our key horizons where we can tie in a floating um, chronology from radiocarbon. And as I mentioned before, Bao, uh, Rui Bao in his nature communication paper here, and also now uh, Tobias Schwesterman in the, in the EPSL paper, hopefully, um, is using this ramped pyrolysis um, radiocarbon age um, where, where different temperature fractions are being dated. And, and th there are emerging hypotheses that maybe we can use this as some kind of a radio, radio, um, uh, radiogenic clock after deposition as different fractions decay, uh, like indicated by this vertical line. This is really kind of just methodological ideas and, and methods to be developed. But having such a, having such a big IODP um, uh, project with a lot of smart brains from all over the world, um, and, and, and as you know, IODP is, is open. Um, uh, it's an open um, policy, open science policy. So one year after the expedition, actually, all data and all samples will, will become available. And also, if, if one of you out there in the in the community has ideas, please contact me or, or Kenny Kehara as the, as the chief scientist. If, if you can propose complementary science, we can also always kind of consider um, adding or, or considering you of already adding you to onshore, onshore science part if you have some exciting science targets. Um, I, I didn't mention now this. This is also innovation that 
like uh, Toshi Kanamatsu tries to do using secular variation of magnetic stratigraphy also to to get an, and some initial data uh, on the Japan Trench suggests that we may also be able um, to use this. Um, but but that's I think that's well as as everywhere I guess in, in sedimentology or stratigraphy dating is the key. So we will have major efforts in, in order to 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 get reliable edge models. So I think this brings me to the end um, um, of the of as as an outlook of this IODP expedition. Huh? Which, which, which hopefully will succeed in, in, in uh, getting this piston course. And if we succeed, we can potentially produce a fascinating record unraveling an earthquake history that is 10 to 100 times longer than what is currently available information and would contribute to a tremendous advance in the understanding of the recurrence pattern of giant earthquakes. And also, as I try to show in this talk a little bit, it's not just about earthquakes, but it's actually sampling and studying a, a remote environment, which is heavily undersampled. And, and by, by adding this, this lots of samples and, and, and cores and stratigraphy, we hope to provide new constraints on sediment and carbon flux of event-triggered sediment remobilization to a deep sea trench and its influence on the Hadl environment. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to try to answer your question. Thank you very much. Super. Thank you so much, Mickey, for that wonderful presentation. Um, you weren't joking. There was a lot of data that we got to see. <laughs> so um, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And I think it was a nice sort of compilation of all of the work that you guys have been doing over the, the last um, few years. So whenever you guys have questions, um, you can type them into the chat, make sure and send them to everybody, not just to one um, individual privately. And if you like, please tell us where you're coming from as we love to see where people are tuning in. Okay, um, I had a question, but I will leave this for the end as we already have some popping up. Um, Philip from Berlin says, hey, Mickey, thanks for the talk. Do you expect the methods presented here, radiocarbon, TOC, et cetera, to be applicable in other HADL zones um, like Chile, Sunda, Tonga? How alike are these sedimentary environments? Yeah, right. Um, so we, we, we start to look a little bit and, and on the different trench physiographies or so. And, and I, I think one key element is, is to see if, um, if uh, the, 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 the trench has a direct connectivity to somewhere a, a, a large sedimentary supply system. You know, there are, there are especially like thousand Chile, there's tremendous amount of sediment coming in there. Um, um, so, so it would be different because there definitely we do have a, um, a source. But just methodologically, um, I, I, would, I would say that actually this, this organic carbon um, geochemistry method that, that was that was pushed here from ETH Zurich um, and Tim Eglinton's group and Rui Bao now is building a big a big lab in China to to further study this and so so I, I think these these methods are applicable uh, I guess the challenge is a bit grain size and so so there it's a lot grain size dependent in the Japan trench we are we are lucky to mostly have very fine grain sediments. So, so because the interpretation of the organic carbon is also like, you know, the, the surface activity of, of this mm -hmm. particular organic matter and, and all these kind of things, of which I am not really the expert of, I have to admit. Um, but but concept and especially the dating, I think the dating um, using either this high high throughput bulk organic carbon dating or the REM pyrolysis is, is certainly a nice, a nice new method here. Yes. Um, anybody else? Yep, I knew one was coming. All right. Um, Stephen is joining us from Wales. And he says, just checking that I heard correctly, following disturbance, the water stayed turbid for months. Yes, absolutely so. Um, and, and actually, I mean, we are, we're still kind of trying to get our heads around this. Uh, the, the actual sampling, uh, it, 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 it's at, at, in, in 2012, which was a month after the after the, the cruise, sampling still was very tricky. So so it was still 
it was still kind of a fluid mud type of, of, of rheology and, 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 and consolidation may actually, may actually take a while. We are trying to, so we try to do some experiments, some time series experiments of, of sampling the same, well, as, as close you can get to the same site in seven kilometer water depth, but at least the same basin and try to see Trans, like time trans, trans and things. So, so, there, so, so certainly the video observation are, are clear data that, that supports this, this huge suspension cloud, um, but also deposition and, and the post-depositional processes of, of like this, this just, it's just a densification of a, of, a, of a cloud, right? Which kind of turns into fluid mud and eventually becomes sediment. So it's very interesting physical properties, very interesting or water geochemical processes that are happening. So, so yes. I mean, I have to say maybe related to this, um, a, a magnitude nine earthquake is not a single earthquake. Huh? I mean, there is there is this huge earthquake, and then there's over month they are still up to magnitude seven and maybe even eight. I think there was maybe a magnitude eight aftershock a couple of days after. So actually, the that the whole margin keeps being steered and shaken for for several months. So this would this would always kind of keep keep the the sediment in suspension. Mm. Yeah. So maybe it would be interesting to take a look at um, the suspension compared to the sort of final pulse. Pardon, I missed that. Well, Sorry, can you? So sort of like the last the final earthquake or the last earthquake in that set, and compare the. Um, the sediment suspension in the water, how long you have sort of that mud cloud in the water column um, compared to the last event. Right, right, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, there was no continuous sampling down there. I guess that's that's the next stage we, sure. we, we monitor and wait. Yeah. But, uh, but there are, there, I mean, there are other events. Um, I think the Karyako Basin already back in, in, in like 30, uh, 20 years ago did, did, did had a, a sediment trap and, and, and cover and, and was was able to to, to sample um, um, this suspension cloud over over longer time. But yes, mo monitoring would really be the next step to test this. Yeah. Okay. Um, our next question is um, from Val. She's joining us from Oslo. Do you see any sedimentary structures in the earthquake triggered deposits? Yes. Yes. Um, so so do, so so they are they they they, they do have. Not the 2011 one, but the older ones. They they do have some nice turbidites um, with even some some classical cross cross laminations. So at the very base, so, so these are these are um, 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 flows, not not just suspension cloud, but but then the upper part, just the, the upper meter or so. But even in there, um, there are sometimes tiny little silt layers or so. Um, we, which, which also we, we kind of are stretching our heads around um, whether whether these are small successive of events. And I think this is this is what we currently favor as as like a depositional model that we are actually seeing the entire um, aftershock sequence. So mm -hmm. so basically we, we we do see a lot and, and maybe even talking about this fluid mud situation, maybe even kind of if, if you have like after two months or so, you have another earthquake within the aftershock sequence that remobilizes again, you may actually kind of inter like like strategy not strategy like in the water column actually. Mm -hmm. You within the density structure you may you may bring in a smaller thin turbidite that comes. So this is a, it, it gets quite a comp uh, an interesting um, so this this is observed and, and also described in, in the paper by Ikehara. Um, based on on uh, radiographs and, and XCTs, no, not XCTs, scans, radiographs, um, and but we will we will definitely investigate this in more details with us, like like micro CT and CT to really get the sedimentary structures out there. Yeah. I just found out that Val is actually Valentin, so sorry Valentin. <laughs> um, so he is joining us from Oslo. Uh, all right, our next question is from uh, Roman. Hi, Roman. Um, he's coming from Vancouver. He says, hi, um, thank you very much for such a great talk. Do you see a correlation between sediment volume deposited and earthquake magnitudes? No. <laughs> um, that, I, I mean, it, yes, it's the holy grail, right? We, we kind of, as, uh, we, we want to somehow 
relate the the the, the deposits and and infer infer um, but but um, maybe I I can can well anyway um it, it's it's actually it's still physiography controlled because the, the the density flows travel into the depot center and so so it 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 really is all about getting the right site sampled to really to really um infer what happened upslope and, and infer the, the, the shaking um, intensities or so. Um, but for, for the physiography, we really see a, a huge volume in the thousand part. Um, but the idea actually, and, and we, we can do this, and that's shown in the kind of in the summary paper by Kyoka et al, that, that um, if, if, we, if we don't look at single cores and single thickness, but if we look at patterns over the entire, over the entire trench along strike, um, area, then we start to see pattern at least how large the area was that was affected. And if we understand flow paths and flow mechanism, how how this these flows kind of travel into into the depositional area, we we hopefully will be able to at least reconstruct the the rupture areas, and then we may have a proxy on on the size. And the same is true, and these are these are other ideas now tested by by American colleagues. That actually, if if this if this um, this idea, this hypothesis of the superficial sediment remobilization that is just peeling off the surface, um, you may need some 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 very specific earthquake characteristics like long duration, low frequency waves, and and there is there is a physical behavior. Um, on on how large magnitude earthquakes react differently through through the entire upper plate characteristic filtering and attenuating the high frequency waves or so. But these are just hypotheses and ide ideas. And I, I believe we still need to do a lot of work to deconvolve the record for for quantitative um, information. A lot of great ideas out there. It works sometimes in lakes, sometimes in the ocean. But but we really need to understand our our stratigraphy and do our sedimentological homework to to really understand how 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 the deposits are deposited before yeah. we can do this. Yeah. How all these things interplay. Okay, our next question is from Sebastian, coming from Houston. So it's great talk, Mickey. I'm curious if you were able to determine a direct correlation between total thickness of de the deposit with Earth. Oh. Uh, yep, so same question, more or less. So hopefully that first part got answered from you. Um, did you have any surprises looking at that, given the densification phenomena of deposits after experiencing seismic shaking? Oh, that's a good one. I've never thought about that. So, so that, I mean, we, we know that concept of, we, we, I think we call that seismic strengthening or so, that like, by 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 seismic shaking, we've actually densified the, the deposit um, or on the slopes or so. This is why in active margin um, slopes are often kind of over consolidated with respect to their to their overburden stress. Um, but I have never thought about this to apply actually in the in the deposit. That, yeah. I mean, I think in, in in the very beginning, this these deposits may may still behave as as fluid or as fluid mud. So I'm not entirely familiar how because how how shaking. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. I think I should think about that and yeah. and about the physical properties of this deposit. Definitely, and Thank I'm, you. I'm yeah. sure. Um... Sebastian, you can look up the email address of Mickey if you don't have it already, and you guys can chat a bit more yeah. and go over some ideas. Maybe you're a good um, a good person to submit some ideas for the next cruise. <laughs> uh, okay, we have a follow-up on Stephen's question um, in terms of the sediment cloud. So how does this long-lasting suspension cloud lead to um, homogeneities rather than normal grading? Well, I... Th I th I'm I'm not sure whether we actually have done the the the, the detailed um, analysis to see if there isn't 
a, a, a slight grading in there because it, it's just all fine grain and mostly diatomaceous mud and, and we still are challenged by measuring grain size of diatomaceous mud because if we if we run our you know the set the settling is 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 may not actually be dependent on on grain size and on, on like how how the diatom frostals inter interact and, and flocculate or so um so so i i mean i agree it's a it's a good question and, and maybe there is like a very 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 subtle overall trend and we see it in the density and we even see it in the in the physical properties such as magnetic susceptibility and and, and a lot of the of the xrf um data suggests at least that 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 a given mineral uh, uh sorry a given element shows so shows some grading grading well grading if if, if it's like at least a, a, a subtle decrease yeah. And I think we just haven't got down to the to the point where we actually looked in detail at the grains. But I would expect the signal to be there, actually. Yeah. Okay, our next question is uh, from Ed, coming from Durham. Hi, Mickey. Thanks for a great talk. A follow up to the previous questions. Given that you're looking at individual mini basins, do you see any evidence of flow reflection in the sedimentary deposits? Do you have enough cores from the same basin to be able to identify such things? Hi Ed, thanks for this question. Good question. That would be like a sesh in the in the Hadl trench. Um, I look forward to to think about this um, um, this and and um, probably yes. Huh? So there, but, but again, this is not a detailed research that we that we have attacked. Um, in the central basin, we have something like ten to twenty cores on on like a few square kilometer area. The problem there is that actually the seafloor has been uplifted as a function of a, of a slip to the toe and gravitational collapse. So, so we cannot, con so like the, while, while the event is occurring, seafloor is changing. Mm -hmm. um, but in the other basins, like we don't have, we don't have evidence for um, in, in the reflection, like in the hydroacoustic profiles. So we can, we cannot test this because of resolution problem. And in, in none of the other basins yet, we have two cores um, where we would test this. But the IODP experiment is designed to have two coring sites at, in each basin to, to sample the expanded stratigraphy and, um, and the condensed stratigraphy. And, and there are research proposals among scientists to test and identify this. Um, it, it's a great hypothesis so far, no data to, to test this, but thanks. Yeah. Hopefully in uh, 2021 fall, you can come back and give us an update. Um, okay, our next question is from Kai from Italy. It says, hi, Mickey, great talk indeed. I was wondering if there's any plan to implement these insights on exhumed fossil successions. Well, that's a wonderful that's a wonderful question. I submitted an ERC grant, but it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't funded um, because I I would like to go back to all dull muddy sequences of active margin uh, like accretion settings where 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 we sedimentologists just map shales and say, well, and and and, and may, may, maybe actually it, it would be so. But I, I think the challenge is it's really it's all it's it's all fine. It's matter. It's all matter, and it will just be it will just be kind of go into the stratigraphic record. I mean, first of all, it's in a subduction zone environment, so it's either being subducted or accreted, so it will <laughs> it will experience heavy deformation. Mm -hmm. um, but but even if we if we get somehow like a nicely upthrusted. Um, 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 hanging wall of, of, of a decolmo thrust where we can preserve stratigraphy. Um, it, it, it would be it would be wonderful to actually. And I think that the, the challenge really is is, is to identify um, homogeneous or you know these thick packages, which probably in the rock record will be will be <laughs> will be down to to a centimeter or so. And I mean, even in the course, we barely see it actually. It's, it's barely, and, and we, so X-ray um, radiography and, um, and, uh, and, and uh, CT scans help us to distinguish bioturbated structures from non-bioturbated structures. 
And we are now actually trying to learn by repeated coring experiments how these how these homogeneous actually get get cannibalized by mm -hmm. by perturbation or so and all these kind of things. Um, it's uh, m maybe if we really are able to to get some geochemical proxies, um, be it like like by XRF core logging or so that we can apply, but, but we would need to apply it on like a micro or like a, a hundred micro, 200 micrometer on these very thin shales or so. Mm -hmm. um, but but yes, I think mud is a wonderful, or shales are, 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 are a wonderful, um, are a wonderful environment and they're anything else than, everything else than dull and boring. They must have, they must have an interesting stratigraphy. It's just hard to study it. Huh? Yeah. Okay, everybody. Well, thank you very much for joining us to get today. Um, Mickey, thank you again for the wonderful presentation and a look at um, next steps as well. That was quite cool. Um, don't forget that next week's seminar is an earlier time. So it's 9 a.m. UK time. And we will be hearing from Lorna Strachan from the University of Auckland, where she'll discuss earthquakes and volcanism. So come back next Wednesday and um, we'll see you then. Bye, everybody.